Thank you to everyone who's joining us, whatever your time zone might be. Um, I no longer say good morning, good evening, a good afternoon. I don't know where you are and what time you might be coming to us in, but we're delighted that you are joining us for this conversation on Pathways to Environmental Justice. Uh, this is a session uh, that has been organized by an impact coalition on just institutions and the International Court of Justice and an impact coalition on earth governance. Impact coalitions were formed as civil society led endeavors up to the summit of the future. The summit of the future being held as a once in a generation opportunity for seismic change at the United Nations. Uh, that has led to contemplation of all sorts of different um, policy and topical reforms. Here, we have uh, undertaken a series that looks at the role of international justice institutions, their interplay with regional systems and with their complementarity with domestic institutions. Uh, we've looked at the International Court of Justice as the cornerstone of the UN Charter, as the fundamental judicial institution envisioned as a, a global system of accountability. We have looked at the International Court, uh, Criminal Court, and we have looked at tribunals such as the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea and uh, ad hoc tribunals uh, and regional uh, uh, courts as well. Here, we are going to take a deep dive into environmental justice. As many may be aware, um, over the course of just the last couple of years, uh, environmental justice has taken a major set of leaps in terms of its contemplation in international courts and tribunals, as well as in domestic jurisdictions. And so you will hear from an array of esteemed speakers about the next phases of accountability for the crimes that confront our planet and humanity. Um, we will have um, a uh, exploration of the crime of ecocide, um, both within the international criminal court system and beyond. We will look at cases before the International Court of Justice and the International Court Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And we will also contemplate new and um, perhaps novel ways of achieving justice for environmental crimes such as an international environmental court and international anti-corruption court. My name is Rebecca Schutt. I am the co-convener of the uh, international, uh, the uh, two actually um, coalitions that have come together to uh, sponsor this event. Um, one, the Impact Coalition on the Just Institutions in the International Court of Justice, and, and next on Earth Governance. I'm also the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, which is a U.S.-based NGO that for more than 75 years has uh, supported the U.N. system, including reform thereof. So with that being said, um, it is my utmost privilege to introduce our first speaker, um, Kate McIntosh, who's the executive director of the UCLA Law Promise Institute, Europe. She is based in the Netherlands and she served as the inaugural executive director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights. And she's worked in the fields of human rights, international criminal justice, and the protection of civilians for three decades. She was involved in the development of international criminal law and its fledgling years and contributed to divining many elements of this new area of law, such as the elements of rape as an international crime, the definition of protected persons, and the scope of complicity for international crimes. She's held multiple roles at international criminal tribunals, working as a lawyer with judges, prosecution, appeals counsel, co-counsel for the defense, and finally as an administrator. Why Kate is with us here today is because she was the lead on a seminal report about which you will hear shortly, defining the crime of ecocide under international law. 
And she will also speak about uh, international law more broadly as uh, it applies to environmental justice. So Kate, with that, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, and uh, hi to everybody who's tuning in. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, such an important week with the Summit of the Future approaching, and of course, so important to look at the climate in the context of that. So um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on international criminal law uh, in this conversation about judicial pathways towards environmental justice. And there is increasing attention being, pay, being paid to how international criminal law can protect the environment. So maybe just to wheel back a bit, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is international criminal law? Well, one answer is to say it is the crimes that are enunciated in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and the crime of aggression. Another way of describing international criminal law would be to say that it's concerned with acts which the international community as a whole has determined to be beyond the pale. So crimes which are of international concern or crimes that wherever they're committed are thought to be crimes against all of us. So the classic uh, international crime might be the crime of genocide, you know, the attempt to uh, destroy a human group. And the idea is that wherever that human group, you know, whether or not we're part of that human group, destroying a human group is actually a crime against all of us. We are all the poorer for that act. So many have called for the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court to be able to use the tools at his disposal, so the crimes already in the statute, to address the environmental and climate crisis. So, for example, communications have been submitted to the court about um, a situation in Cambodia. Uh, where populations have been forcibly displaced from their lands to make way for massive palm oil plantations. Now, the crime that's actually charged is the forced displacement, because that is something that could qualify as a crime against humanity. But along with the impact on the people who are displaced is a concern about the palm oil industry and the palm oil monoculture and the effect that that's having on our climate and environment. And um, so that communication has been submitted to the prosecutor. Numerous communications have been submitted about the situation in Brazil, in particular, and the destruction of the Amazon. Uh, and in particular, around the destruction of the traditional habitat of uh, you know, indigenous peoples living in the Brazilian Amazon. And that people have tried to characterize as a crime against humanity. So a widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population or possibly as genocide insofar as it may be accompanied by the intent to actually destroy some of those indigenous groups. So these are all communications that NGOs, activists, lawyers have sent to, into the court, um, but no such cases have been brought, <clears throat> as um, you're probably all aware. So the prosecutor hasn't acted on any of those situations, whether or not he would have been able to. Uh, but now the prosecutor is has announced that he's developing a strategy on the prosecution of environmental crimes. In other words, he is looking to how to use the existing crimes in the statute to protect the environment. And what does he mean by environmental crimes? Well, he means a crime that is caused by or results in environmental harm. So the examples I gave of the Cambodia or Brazil situation would be the kind of situations that could be contemplated by the prosecutor. So the prosecutor has issued a call for public input. That's actually closed already. Um, the Promise Institute, uh, my team, are supporting him in this process. Uh, and we expect that he will issue a draft of his policy at some time uh, this autumn. So for any of you who are interested in contributing, there will be a call for public comments on the draft as well. So the question will be for him, how can I use the existing crimes that I have in the statute to deal better with environmental destruction? So it marks an understanding and an acceptance that destruction of our common environment is something which should be of concern to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And his mandate is to look at international crimes, so crimes of international concern. So this is a very positive move uh, 
generally, and it reflects efforts that have been going on around the world, and we'll hear more about them this morning, to, uh, to use international law to address this in increasingly pressing crisis. But the prosecutor's efforts, uh, very laudable and welcome as they are, still leave a massive gap because the crimes in the Rome Statute are really focused on harm directed against humans. You know, they are anthropocentric. So all of them require um, the prosecutor to establish that there is some kind of attack directed against human beings. So as I described, the clearing of the palm oil, the clearing of the of the of the large swathes of land in Cambodia to plant palm oil, that would be charged because of the people that were forcibly displaced. The destruction of the forest of the Amazonian forest in Brazil, that could be charged insofar as it destroyed the lives of the forest dwellers in Brazil. And in each case, it would have to be shown that there was an intention to harm the population. Now, most of our environmental destruction, of course, it's massively harmful to all of us, but it's not done with the intent to harm us, right? It's usually done for profit motives, essentially. So it's really hard to fit the real issues of concern into existing international criminal law. And that's why we're proposing to add a new fifth crime of ecocide to the statute of the International Criminal Court. So I say we, um, because I was part of a group, um, which uh, I'll show you now. James, if you could put the, uh, if you could put the, the slideshow up. Uh, so I'm part of a group of people, but also part of a, a global movement, which is calling for a new international crime of ecocide. And if we think back to how I defined international crimes earlier on, you know, a crime that wherever it's committed is a crime against all of us and a crime of international concern. I mean, what could be more obviously an international crime than destroying our shared environment? So uh, you can see on the screen um, a picture of uh, 12 people. Uh, from 2020 to 2021, I was a member of this group um, who were uh, pulled together, convened to develop a definition of an international crime, which could be proposed as the crime of ecocide to amend the statute of the International Criminal Court. And the idea of ecocide, of course, um, has been around for a lot longer um, and has been used by, by different uh, groups uh, concerned with the environment. But what we felt at that point was needed to really move this forward was a plausible definition written in the language of international criminal law, which could be proposed um, to be amended into the statute. So I won't go into the definition in detail, but I'll just show it to you. Uh, James, if you could move to the next slide. Um, so the Rome Statute has the four crimes that I mentioned earlier. It has genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. And if you could move to the next slide, James, I can show you our suggestion for the amendment. Can somebody move to the next slide? I think there's a delay. Oh, okay. I see screen uh, slide two, uh, ecocide oh, okay. in the definition. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It might take a second to come through. Okay. Well, I was going to just show you the language and also give you um, a reference where you can uh, look up the definition and some kind of explanatory commentary of it in more detail. But um, I don't see it coming through yet, James. I don't know if uh, anybody else does. No, James, it, it's still not coming through. Um, I don't know if there's a way you can manually. I will I will stop sharing screen and do it again and see if I can move to the second screen. If you can just bear with me one second. Thank you so much, James. Sure. Well, I can explain a little bit about the process, which is what I was um, planning to do. So the 12 of us there were, oh, there's the, there's the, there's the crime, um, but I'll carry on. The 12 of us were brought together by the Stop Ecocide Foundation, which is a you know a, a, an NGO essentially. So it was a private initiative, although it was on the request of some Swedish parliamentarians to come up with this definition. And it was a very um, diverse group. It was a fantastic group to work with. Um, among the group was a former judge of the International Criminal Court, um, Lord, uh, yeah, Neroni Slade of Samoa, um, Philippe Sands and Dior Falsa were actually the chairs of the panel, not, not me. Uh, I was a deputy chair. 
Um, we have an environmental lawyer from Bangladesh. I'm just looking now. We had uh, Charles Jallo, who is a member of the International Law Commission from Sierra Leone. Uh, we had uh, Pablo Fajardo, a very, um, very well-known environmental lawyer from Ecuador who litigated against Chevron. We had Christina Voigt, who's a climate lawyer from Norway. It was a really broad and diverse group in every sense. And thanks for going back, James. So if you could hop forward again. Perfect. So this is the crime. We propose that ecocide for the purpose of this statute means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. And I won't unpack all of that here because I don't know how detailed uh, you know, the interest is in that. Uh, but I will say that we drew on existing notions of international law to craft that crime. Um, and the point of it was really that the prosecutor does not have to show human harm in order to prosecute that crime. What we're looking at is severe and either widespread or long term damage to the environment. And that in itself is an international crime. And James, if you could just jump through to the last slide. Yeah, there's another paragraph with definitions, which I won't talk about. But at this site, ecosidelaw.com, you can find the, um, the definition and an explanation as well as other material about ecocide. Um, OK, thank you. That was the presentation. So um, where are we with that to close with the ecocide proposal? Well, um, it has not yet been proposed as an amendment to the International Criminal Court Statute, but we are hopeful that that might occur this autumn. Um, the proposal has to be made three months before the annual meeting of the state's parties, which is in December this year. So September is the month to look out for a proposal, which would be very exciting. Uh, and then it will go in to be discussed by the states that are parties to the court. What we have seen, however, is uh, unexpected ramifications in national laws. So our proposal and the text of our proposal, that language that I just showed you, has become the um, has formed the core of proposed laws in uh, about 15 different countries around the world. All of that's detailed on ecosidelaw.com and has actually passed into law in Belgium. It's slightly different wording, but basically the elements are the same, as well as featuring in the Environmental Crimes Directive, the new Environmental Crimes Directive, which um, came into force in the European Union in May of this year. So unexpectedly to us, it's taken a while to get a proposal at the International Criminal Court, but it has moved really fast at national and regional level, which is, is pretty interesting. And uh, of course, the two go together. And the more that national jurisdictions um, introduce an inter a crime of ecocide, the more likely it is that we'll get that amendment at the International Criminal Court. And with that, um, I think I'll stop. And I'm very happy to talk more about that in questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, and we are very much looking forward to developments hopeful at the Assembly of States parties in December this year in The Hague. Um, I would be interested in hearing a little bit, um, perhaps, um, in the, the conversation. We'll have discussion after all of our three speakers have had their interventions about which states parties have, have been supportive and how you see civil society or those in the, the proverbial room, the Zoom room, um, able to move this forward from their various vantage points. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pivot to our next speaker. And for those who have raised hands, thank you. We will come to you in the uh, discussion session. And please use that question and answer function very freely. Um, uh, Dr. County Graham, and if you could please, uh, James Spotlight, uh, Dr. Graham, uh, is a New Zealand diplomat, parliament, former parliamentarian, academic, and former UN official. Um, he has uh, been involved in regional negotiations for the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone and has represented New Zealand at the Con UN Conference on Disarmament. He was also the Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action, where he developed the concept of the planetary interest for promoting in par promotion in parliaments around the world. Um, 
Dr. Graham has been a leader in um, parliamentary work towards environmental justice, including at the ICC. And therefore that will be the subject of his discussion. So um, uh, Honorable Graham, uh, I will leave the floor to you to discuss um, uh, the crime of ecocide at the International Criminal Court and specifically perhaps what we could do to advocate there too. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Kia ora tato, uh, Māori uh, greeting of greetings to everybody. Um, I'm talking to you from uh, Waiheke Island in New Zealand, and uh, I want to, I want, I'd like to start by just commending um, MEGA, the Mobilising Earth Governance and the Impact Coalition for the work that you're doing and for organising this. Um, there is nothing more important work. Than, than what you are doing, and I commend you strongly for it. And and perhaps two others, uh, Earth Trusteeship Initiative, which I understand is, is related. Um, a good close colleague of mine, Professor Klaus Bosselman, is, uh, has been leading the Earth Trusteeship Initiative for decades. Um, he's a law professor, an environmental law professor here, lives 200 meters away uh, in, in here in uh, Waiheke Island. And he's, he's been a member of the New Zealand Centre for Global Studies uh, with me since 2012. And then thirdly, um, Stop Ecocide, and especially the independent expert panel um, that Kate was, has been on and talking about. And I mentioned that uh, as well because a, a good colleague, uh, His Excellency Tuiloma Naroni Slade from Samoa uh, was on it. And, uh, had attended one of our symposiums, our centre symposium at Auckland University just last August, a, a year ago now. So um, the purpose of my talk here in, in hopefully just 10 minutes is uh, headed up as advocating towards criminalising ecocide. And uh, I'll also broaden it, I'll, I'll address that, but I'll get to that. But I'll, I'll get to that by way of an introduction of a broader aspect that Alan had suggested that I look at the broader consideration of potential pathways to environmental justice and then where ecocide might fit within that. So um, starting off with that, going backwards as it were, um, starting with the pathways to environmental justice, I, I, there are probably four, I suppose, in the broadest sense, uh, declaratory and resolutions, uh, mainly at the United Nations General Assembly, treaty obligations of states, for state responsibility, ICJ advisory opinions, and na national case law. And uh, as has been said, there is increasing speed and momentum and force on each one of those. Starting with the declaration, we, we were talking about ecocide and where it began. I think there was one person who'd coined the term, but it was Olaf Palmer in 1972, Stockholm, the conference. Um, who did use the word at a very high level in, um, in fact, condemning one state for committing it you know, back there in the early 70s. The next one I would like to mention is 1982, 10 years later, the World Charter for Nature, um, Resolution 37.7, and I'll, I'll go back to that uh, later on at the end. Um, obviously, there are so many, but there's another 10 years, 1992, Rio Declaration, um, another conference and, and uh, treaty obligations coming out of the negotiations related to that. More recently, 2009, Resolution 64196, Harmony with Nature. We're getting into the moral dimension of it and the empathetic dimension of the relationship between humanity and biodiversity and the planet. And then 2022, um, the human right to clean, healthy, sustainable environment. Again, resolution, General Assembly Resolution 76 3. Uh, treaty obligations that are relevant to this in terms of state responsibility, obviously 1958 Antarctic Treaty System, 67 perhaps, Outer Space, 92, the Climate Change uh, Convention and the Biodiversity Convention, um, and 1994 when the Law of the Sea finally came into force, UNCLOS. Uh, they are relevant to what we're talking about today. 
ad advisory, international ICJ advisory opinions, the, the two obvious ones, one that is complete, 1995, on... Uh, possession and use of nuclear weapons, which was uh, historic and major and has changed our thinking, including formal state thinking. And then very recently, 2023, uh, on climate change um, with the leadership of Vanuatu. And, and uh, that will be another ICJ um, advisory opinion. And then nation, national case law, as, as we said, things are... <laughs> Uh, heating up. Uh, there's at least 10 to 20 states, I think, in each case that um, are, are quite active in terms of litigation, national level litigation, on the issues of legal personhood. New Zealand is one of the leaders there, India um, and uh, New Zealand and uh, Bolivia and others. Uh, climate change, obviously, and and now ecocide. There are a number of states, small number of states, that have actually brought it into their national legislation. So that those are the four broadest pathways to environmental justice. Um, the questions that come up is in terms of which legal pathway might be best uh, now for ecocide. Um, and we start to get into the more difficult uh, controversial issues. Should we see it as state responsibility or as individual liability? Criminal liability um, is the first obvious questions. States basically don't commit crimes. They, they have state responsibility. If they commit an unlawful act, they're up against it in the UN Charter, not least uh, under Chapter 7 and, and with military force enforcement action against them. But it's very, very different from... Uh, um, individual criminal liability, which tends to concentrate the mind of the individual national leader a little bit more, uh, frankly, and we, we may not have time to go into that. Um, the question then is, should there be a new treaty um, for either state responsibility and see what happens with that? Or should there be amendments to existing treaties, the outer space, UNCLOS, and so on, <laughs> to try to get ECOCIDE um, right across the the, the boundary, but that's far too complicated and wouldn't work. And I, I think this is all background to why um, the independent panel and, and, the, and the groups are focusing in on the side with the Rome Statute. You could have special tribunals for individual liability, uh, many special tribunals, and, and some of our colleagues have worked on them, um, but uh, it's... Um, it's highly unlikely they would be set up by the major powers, certainly by the Security Council. So that's really not uh, possible either. So we're, so then you have the Rome Statute and the idea of an amendment uh, of a new crime. Uh, and the, the challenge, well, now we get into the business of political challenges to it. Um, let, me, let me say that I am personally fully committed and supportive of the idea of criminalizing ecocide. Uh, and so everything I say now would be in the context of trying to make the political judgments or outline the political argumentation for and against as to where to go. Um, Ecocide, as, as we know, was initially floated and rejected during the negotiations for the Rome Statute back in the mid 90s. Uh, so was nuclear weapons. And the four came out in, uh, in the final statute and neither nuclear weapons nor Ecocide. And essentially, the Rome Statute's um, generic uh, description is the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. So the first theoretical question, if you like, is, is ecocide, as defined, um, one of those most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole? I think it gets through that test uh, fairly effortlessly um, by probably a vast majority of humanity. Uh, so we go into the next stage of questioning, and and that is um, what what is is the Rome Statute the appropriate uh, vehicle for for doing that? And now we start to get into more controversial areas because essentially the Rome Statute, as 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 was implied and as we know, um, essentially address four anthropocentric crimes. And we know which ones they are. And their birth dates are from 1899, essentially, to 1945. So they are historically established. 
Uh, although that said, they were given conscious birth at Nuremberg in, in 1945. So, um, but that is different from ecocide in the 2020s. Um, so, and if we do ec ecocide in the Rome Statute, then we have one ecocentric crime and uh, four anthropocentric crimes. Um, and that, on first blush, that may be just um, thematic and definitional. Uh, but if you get into the into the issue of the definition, um, issues come up. The and and looking at the definition of the expert panel, I think it's brilliantly done professionally and I think it meets most of the criteria for um, action that both the thresholds the two thresholds and the definition double threshold I think is good um, I do I have two two comments about th that area of the definition one is a question really um, uh, can do we are we confident that quote long-term damage can be assessed in criminal litigation and criminal judgment in the short term uh, because you can't wait over the long term to, to establish it. So that's that's first question. And I, I, I'm sure there's a sound legal argument to that, but I think that needs to be there. Uh, second point, um, I have a stronger view and, and it's maybe it's not critical, but I think it's worth considering. And that is, uh, personally, I would not include outer space. Um, I think it raises more complications than it than than is it anything that is, it achieves. We we have a failed moon treaty, which is tragic uh, and needs reattention. But we have an outer space treaty, and the question is whether they're being properly observed or not. But I think it it even reduces the the political and moral force of the definition of ecocide, if we confine it to the planet and biodiversity, and that's the stated um, rationale with which I strongly agree. So I, I would query the, the inclusion of outer space. And then, then I think there's two issues that could be problematic, uh, the issue of mens rea and the issue of endangerment. In both cases, there are new levels because of its, ec because its ecocide that are brought in compared with the four anthropocentric crimes. Uh, with mens rea, it's substantial likelihood uh, rather than near certainty. And, and that, that could raise in, in, a, in, in refined legal argumentation, massive issues. And similarly with endangerment, it introduced a new level, a crime of endanger, endangerment as opposed to a material result. So you can see the, the legal jurisprudential potential problems. I'm not wanting to create problems that may not be there, but I do think we have to be aware of, of where these may lead us. Um, so those, those are there. I'll, I'll finish on the political, some political points. And I think we ought to uh, ask, what is the political purpose that we're wanting to achieve with ecocide in, in law by making it a crime? Is it universality or is it bringing it in rather like the Prohibition Treaty of Nuclear Weapons, bringing it in with a minority or a small majority of 193 UN member states, but bringing it into international law and making it a crime? Is it the qualitative issue of making it a crime or is it the quantitative issue of wanting a huge majority for universality as is biodiversity, uh, the, um, the chemical weapons and the bio um, biological weapons conventions. Uh, if we look at the at the numbers, um, the uh, for example, the the nuclear ban treaty has seventy parties right now, and and th and that's got dignity. Although I know of, I, in fact, there was a European ambassador who was talking to me a couple of days ago, who was strongly critical uh, waste of time, because there's only seventy states. I said I had a different view. It's uh, even if it were 20 or 30 or 40, and it was initially 60, 60 states. It brought it into international law, the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And that's qualitative as opposed to quantitative. But I do think that's an issue for exercise that needs to be considered because it, 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 it influences your political judgment of where you want to go. Um, and then the second point is um, the need for... 
uh, with great respect, as I have mentioned, to the expert group, who I think have done a very good definition. Uh, if you look at the story of aggression, the UN General Assembly set up a special working group, <coughs> basically led by Liechtenstein, and Princeton University had a special expert group that was essentially a formal group that reported back to the General Assembly and to the ICC. And it did it did wonderful work. So that's that's the next step, I guess, we have to do. And the final point I'd make is the just just tactically, politically, there is so much in the World Charter for Nature of 1982 that can be explicitly quoted and rest the action on because it's established there in terms of UN declaratory judgments. So um, good luck with it. I, I'll support it where I can. And I, I think it's got a definite future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Graham. And before we move over to our regularly scheduled programming and our next speaker, um, I am going to uh, ask uh, uh, Kay McIntosh if she would like to respond while we're still on the subject of uh, international criminal law, therefore personal liability for environmental crimes, uh, because our next speaker will be entertaining the subject of state responsibility. So Kate, would you like to come in on the subject? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for that um you know, very complimentary, I think, uh, I meant complimentary with an E, but maybe also with an I, uh, presentation that was really helpful. And you, you raised very important questions, which actually, um, it's, it's nice to have the opportunity to respond. And I might quickly respond to one question I've seen in the chat as well on this. Um, so turn to your questions. Um, you know, all very relevant, I think things that we considered. So the issue of long term damage, and you know, how long it takes environmental damage to manifest we were very, very aware of. Those three terms, widespread, long-term and severe, they already appear in international law protecting the environment, um, in laws of war, essentially, international humanitarian law. So um, it seemed, and in fact, they, also, they appear in the Rome Statute already in the one provision that explicitly mentions protecting the environment during conflict. So it seemed to us that we should use those terms. States have already accept them as, accepted them as the parameters for judging harm to the environment. However, exactly your issue was raised and discussed among us. And that's why we didn't take the conjunctive form. So we didn't take the standard as being widespread and long-term and severe, but rather we said in all cases for an international crime, it's going to have to be severe. And in addition to that, it has to be either widespread or long term. So we thought that was a high enough standard to be appropriate. There's also a precedent in a different source, the uh, NMOD Convention prohibiting environmental modification, which uses the three terms in the alternate. So there was that precedent, but we thought that was too low. It would always have to be severe for an international crime. But precisely for the reason that you raised, we thought to require it to always, to prosecutors always have to establish that damage is going to be long term, you know, in the question where environmental harm is um, concerned might be impractical. So thank you for raising that. Your point about outer space, yeah, noted, um, you know, we, we went with that definition, which, which has been used by the ICRC, but I uh, agree that it does um, in, result in some potential difficulties. And then you talked about the mens rea and the endangerment element. So the standard mens rea in the statute in Article 30, as you referred to, is um, you know, intent or essentially virtual certainty that the consequences of a crime will manifest. But that's explicitly said to be the default mens rea. So that's the mens rea which applies unless another mens rea is specified. So it's entirely within the scope of the statute to include a different mens rea. We felt that that was too high for what we were trying to achieve with ecocide because, yeah, it's often not the intent or, you know, it may, or it may be almost impossible scientifically to establish that level of virtual certainty of those consequences. And again, we don't want to have to wait necessarily for those consequences to manifest. So we thought that knowledge of substantial likelihood was the appropriate level. It is an established criminal law mens rea in the common law system 
we would call that subjective recklessness. So the individual does have themselves to know that there's a substantial likelihood. It's not a reasonable person test. The prosecutor will have to prove that that individual did know. Um, and in the civil law systems, it's analogous to what would be referred to as dolus eventualis. So that's what we proposed. It will be up to the state's parties to see whether they accept that, of course. The endangerment one, um, it's not the only crime of endangerment, although perhaps in the way it's drafted, it's slightly different in the Rome statute. So actually the statute, the war crime, which protects the environment, which is the war crime of um, disproportionate attacks, is, for example, it's just one of them, is phrased as launching an attack in the knowledge that X, Y, Z will occur. So it's actually the launching of the attack, which is the crime. So also in that case, the prosecutor doesn't actually have to prove the consequences. It's the knowledge at the time. So it's the creation of a risky situation. So we're not entirely unique there within the statute. Although again, of course, it's definitely a point about which I'm sure there'll be discussion. And then finally, your point about the huge majority or, the, or getting the crime on the books. I think um, we were... All of our conversations were um, conversations trying to balance um, either a very high threshold, which would be acceptable to states, would be more likely to be ratified by a large number, and a somewhat lower threshold, which would capture all the harm that we thought actually should be criminalised. So I think in almost every element of that definition, you'll see the compromise we reached between those two points. So, and I hope that that goes to goes to your question very briefly then because I don't want to take up too much time I did see a question about corporate law and the fact that oh yeah it was from Matthew Ryan Sykes concerned about tension between company law and ecocide the legal principle that a company's objective is to make a profit for its shareholders could be a strong defense against the charge of ecocide well Thank you for putting that question, because actually my response to that would be, this is exactly what we need to rein in that corporate law principle, because it can never be that a company is required to commit a crime. So the whole impact in terms of corporate activities of a crime of ecocide would be to set some limits. And businesses have been among the strongest voices calling for an ecocide law, interestingly enough, because exactly they are bound to maximise profit. But many people in business are very concerned about the environment. And if there was an international crime or a national crime which prohibited them from crossing a particular boundary, then they would have to obey that. And that would, that would actually trump of course, as a criminal law, the principle of making the most profit. So uh, with that, I'll hand back over to the next speaker. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. And so far, as you've heard, we have been talking about individual personal um, uh, liability, under criminal law. Um, what we're going to hear next a little bit more about is state responsibility under existing courts and tribunals, and I think we can also explore a little bit more the confluence and the lacunae between the two. And when we talk about corporate responsibility, therein I think is, is a rub um, in certain jurisdictions, including my own, I'm from the United States, uh, corporate actors for certain reasons and certain times are given status of individual persons and otherwise immune for personal liability. And so far, corporate actors not being, um, by and large, um, under the jurisdiction of either the International Criminal Court System, or as we will soon hear, the International Court System that governs relations between states, uh, is perhaps a major gap that leaves us to um, future um, resolution. So with this, I will give over to our final speaker, my dear friend and co-convener of the International um, Coalition on the impact uh, for the ICJ and just institutions, um, as well as a co-leader on the Legal Alternatives to War campaign. Neshen Gunasakara is an international lawyer. He's an educationist, facilitator, and environmentalist from Sri Lanka. Um, he, as um, perhaps was noted earlier, has been uh, the legacy holder 
of the former vice president and one of the greatest jurists at the ICJ, CJ Wiermontri, about whose legacy I hope we'll hear. And he's currently a visiting fellow at the Wall Rongberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Lund, Sweden, um, as well as uh, uh, a, a fellow at uh, the World Future Council. So Nashan, I'm sure I left many things out of your extensive biography, but thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Rebecca. What a wonderful pleasure to be here and to follow both Professor McIntosh and uh, Honorable Graham's uh, fascinating dialogue on something which is very also close to my heart on eco side. Um, I wish we could have had that discussion for a longer time, but let me try to uh, touch base on uh, some fascinating developments at the international stage vis-a-vis -vis the courts and tribunals, and more specifically the International Court of Justice uh, and the uh, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. And thank you so much for the uh, invitation. It could be more timely. Uh, to discuss this on pathways uh, to achieving uh, environmental justice. It just so happens, and I think um, Honorable Graham also intimated to this, that about a month ago, um, there was a celebration at The Hague of creating the first international tribunal for adjudication at the state's level for the peaceful resolution of disputes. And as was mentioned in 1899, the famous Hague Peace Conference was convened, uh, and one of the outcomes of that 1899 Peace Conference was uh, the establishment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, uh, which uh, celebrated 125 years uh, in July this year. And this conference, I think, paved the way uh, for a number of developments, including the creation of the Permanent Court of International Justice under the League of Nations, which then took over uh, once it was closed in 1946 by the International Court of Justice under the Charter of the United Nations. So my uh, kind of uh, two or three observations that I want to kind of share here is uh, a possible pathways is taking into context what are kind of been developing over the last 15 to 20 years. And I think uh, Judge Vira Mantri was mentioned, and I think... Uh, uh, most uh, students, including myself from international law, would have uh, gone through his various opinions at the International Court of Justice, uh, including his uh, separate celebratory dissenting opinion in the case of the legality of the threat of use of nuclear weapons in 1996, uh, which was an inspiration for generations now and generations of lawyers to come. And that's kind of, uh, I selected a quote from uh, one of these, uh, from this advice European and which sets the uh, kind of tone for what I'm going to share. Yeah, and I quote, it says in the advice European that the environment is not an abstraction, but it represents the living space, the quality of life and the very health of all human beings, including generations yet unborn. So now this is a decision of the uh, International Court of Justice uh, through an advisory opinion 25 years ago. And that's going to be my first pathway. The, the courts and tribunals are not just institutions established at the international level. There are judges and there are roles played by judges. And this complements uh, the work of other international tribunals as well as those at the regional and domestic level. Uh, and the second uh, point I want to do uh, kind of clarify was perhaps between the 19th and the 20th century of development of international law, we saw member states uh, which were just emerging perhaps, especially in the 20th century from what was called the empire period uh, emerging, was looking at member states developing uh, international law. But as uh, Honorable uh, Graham and Professor McIntosh mentioned, over the last 15 to 25 years, the traffic from member states to that the international level has probably reversed from the international level to the domestic and regional sphere. And this is a quite an interesting development. I think that's a fascinating pathway to look at environmental justice. And finally, uh, the inspirational movements that uh, social environmental uh, as well as uh, legal movements, especially young people uh, coming from the Pacific Islands to all the way to the United States are inspiring to bring about change on the climate issue. 
So on, on the first point on uh, the International Court of Justice, as most of you know, uh, there has been a request for an advisory opinion on climate change, which was spearheaded by a group of young leaders from the Pacific Island states, which resulted in uh, an outstanding or historic resolution in the General Assembly where all the United Nations members agreed that this question should be put to the International Court of Justice. And that is itself historic. Here is no objections, no one saying no, everyone's agreeing that this is important and put to the highest court in the world. And within that context, we must also look at what the International Court of Justice has done in the past. And here I refer to a couple of other cases, including the small lander of Nauru taking on Australia back in the late 1980s with the case of the mining of phosphates in Nauru. Now, that's one of the fascinating things about state obligation. The smallest state, perhaps with very little political clout, could take one of the largest states with much more political clout before the International Court of Justice. And in this case, it was Nauru taking on Australia. And the ICJ went into detail about this case and found that Australia was in, in, in violation of its obligations and were requested to pay reparations to Nauru. And Australia did so. And I think one of the other failings of the current kind of communication system or media system in the world is looking at the respect for international law as opposed to when it is being violated. Whenever it's being respected, it's very seldom that you see these being things being picked up at the international media or TV outlets or radios or on the internet. And a large majority of decisions of the International Court of Justice have been respected and member states have gone on to respect the decisions that have been given up. Now, saying that uh, we are in uh, uh, currently in a poly crisis with, of course, over 100 armed conflicts going on across the world and the climate crisis also facing. And it is in this light that the work of the small uh, island states is of significance. And the Commission of Small Island States and of International Law, which was you know, put together not more than three years ago, was inspiring uh, work moved the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea to take up the question of uh, state obligations with regard to the marine environment, marine environment and the greenhouse gas emission. And there is a quite a powerful advice to opinion <clears throat> which came out in May this year from the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Now, to clarify why the ICJ is set up under the UN Charter as its apex court, the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea was set up by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So it's a treaty organization which has quite interesting complementary kind of uh, MOU with the UN uh, bodies. Now, this decision uh, is also historic, uh, given that it talks about the state's responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our oceans and the seas. And one key aspect that I wanted to highlight here and which will be taken up by the International Court of Justice is the development of what we call the best scientific evidence meets indigenous knowledge systems. And I think that's one key takeaway that I think really needs to uh, be highlighted. And I think this is also something that the ecocide movement has taken on board as well. And whilst the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea looked at uh, predominantly the Law of the Sea Convention and how the Law of the Sea applies, the International Court of Justice will be called upon to more broadly look at interpreting public international law in terms of state obligations with regard to the climate question and including rights of future generations. Uh, and here there is an opportunity to bring a wide indigenous knowledge systems to participate in the decisions and the processes before the ICJ. Now, the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea uh, and the Convention has been ratified by over 160 member states. But unfortunately, the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice has been only agreed by 74 countries. Now, as all of you probably already know, member states have to agree to the jurisdictions of these tribunals. But a group of like-minded states led by Switzerland, Japan, and Liechtenstein has moved over the last 10 years to get other members uh, of the United Nations to sign on to the compulsory jurisdiction. And this is one of the key um, uh, actions that we are working on in this group is to try to get them to ratify uh, the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Now, while there is some reluctance from some states, there is broad 
agreement uh, on how uh, the international law and international rule of law ought to work. And the example of how the young people from the Pacific Island states moved to the United Nations General Assembly and have the, all of the member states agree to put this question to the International Court of Justice is again I'm highlighting as a key point. Now, how does the effectiveness of these tribunals work? There is a decision from the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea and the proceedings before the International Court of Justice on the climate change uh, issue will be starting uh, with the public hearing in December, early December this year. It'd be fascinating to see how the work of the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea and the decision on the advice opinion is reflected in the arguments that member states and international organizations are going to be taking up when they go before the ICJ in December. So that's something that we could all look forward to and, and see how this can be worked out. And the second point is that all this is public knowledge. You can follow this cases and the trials online. It's available on the UN web and the ICJ web. And the kind of the oral as well as the written submissions are available online uh, ahead. And this opportunity gives wider civil society to look at uh, what these uh, courts and tribunals and what the member states are thinking uh, in, in 2024 with regard to the climate change issue, especially given that next year marks 10 years since the Paris Agreement, which was an optional uh, voluntary basis on uh, uh, on which member states agreed to pursue the climate goals. Um, and that's one aspect. The second aspect is that these decisions of these courts and the work of the judges uh, more broadly within academia and other areas of work has relevance. And this is something we try to kind of not focus so much on, but all these judges, both courts and tribunals have their own respective uh, engagements outside the courts. And I think that's also a fascinating area to see how these uh, organizations uh, uh, and, and, and the judges work contribute to uh, wider uh, discussions. And one other case that is, of course, of relevance is um, the case of Hungary versus Slovakia, which came before the International Court of Justice in the mid-1990s, and the decision came out in 1997, which highlighted the legal principles of sustainable development. It took it from the conceptual basis, which was established in 1980s through the Brundtland Commission and made it into principles of international law. And that's a, a, a significant development on international environment law. And again, Judge Veeramantri was one of the pioneers who threw his separate opinion in the Gabčikovo case, which is uh, the Hungary versus Slovakia uh, case known in, a, in another way, uh, is, uh, is of great importance. And this uh, decision to set out international environment law kind of spearheaded various other uh, groups to look at how uh, the broader perspective of international environmental law could be developed. And I'm so glad that uh, Honorable Graham mentioned the work of Professor Klaus Boselman, who I have the pleasure of working very closely as, the, as a co-chair of the Earth Trusteeship Working Group right now. And it's fascinating to see how Professor Klaus Boselman has taken international environmental law and transformed into principles of Earth Trusteeship, which we broadly call ecological legal principles. We need to bring the earth at the center of the decision-making process, the earth at the center of the legal processes that we've had, really building on the indigenous world wisdom and indigenous legal systems and combining it. And there's fascinating examples from Australia, New Zealand, all across to Latin America on these things. And final uh, kind of uh, two points on um, the flow of uh, traffic between international tribunals to domestic. And I think uh, there was a quite of a high on international law and principles in the late 1990s. It's almost quarter of a century ago. And I think building on that uh, kind of uh, uh, momentum, we have most of these young lawyers and, and those who are moving uh, this discussion, building on that work, trying to expand on how international legal principles can inform regional and domestic courts. And that's a key aspect that we need to look at as opposed to how over 3,000 years of domestic jurisdiction and domestic court systems have influenced an international system that we are calling 125 years of history. But right now there's a shift in the 21st century and the International Court of Justice going into the advisory opinion on climate change, for my own personal belief, 
is one of the fascinating opportunities at the beginning of this 21st century. And I think it's one of the most important cases to go before the ICJ at this century. And finally, to kind of uh, looking at uh, the social movements, the environment movements, the young people's movements, and over 2,000 climate litigation cases going on at the domestic level, each one of them highlight international legal principles, highlight international environmental principles. And this is a huge opportunity, not within only uh, the litigation process uh, or within the bench, but also the wider bar and the engagement of academia to take these social movements up. And it is not lost on us that farmers and young people's movements are being crushed under power by those old authority across the world at the moment. And it is through holding on to the values that principles of rule of law and international law brings that we can change this tide and help those who are fighting uh, for their voices to be heard in the decision-making process. So I'll end that with that note that there is an opportunity here in 2024 to really build on the work of our ancestors and build a stronger tomorrow. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much, Nashan. Um, you struck a chord that I think Kate also had um, sounded earlier, which is a principle not conveniently called reverse complementarity, but how um, a principle enshrined in international law or precedent, depending on your system of justice, um, therefore can be domesticated whether or not you ratify a treaty. Um, uh, when I was working on the universality of the Rome statute, for instance, we saw the domestication of the four crimes under the ICC statute um, in jurisdictions that weren't able at that point to ratify the treaty. And so therefore, it seems like there are maybe positive, hopeful pathways for environmental justice, as you indicate. Um, before we move on from this topic, and not to put you too much on the spot or to make you a Nostradamus and prognosticate about the future and speculate, but are there lessons from the ITLAS decision that you think will be bearing on the uh, upcoming decision of the ICJ and um, potential domestic and, and regional uh, decisions as well on climate change? Thank you, Rebecca. I mean, the easy answer to that is, well, the oceans and the seas covers 70% uh, of the planet. And I would think uh, member states would think that is relevant for us to, you know, respect the decision, uh, the advisory opinion of the International uh, Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Now, the, of course, we discussed that advisory opinions are not binding on states. And I think... Uh, uh, that's a bit of a misnomer. Although advisory opinions are not binding, it has a much wider influence on decision-making processes. And that's the first thing. And the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea um, uh, decision is fascinating for various reasons. First, it discusses in depth and firmly establishes that the established sciences, as already mentioned before, talks about climate change and how it impacts, especially the anthropocentric or the human-induced climate change and how it impacts on, on the natural environment. And these impacts are irreversible. And that is something that I think needs to be taken into consideration and will link to the ICJ case. Um, the second is that it uh, very loosely links uh, the climate change challenge with human rights, but the International Court of Justice will go into detail about the link between climate change and human rights. And this is going to be a quite a fascinating discussion given the different evolutions of human rights principles over the last 50 to 60 years and where it is established today. And as the uh, you know, Honorable <clears throat> Graham mentioned on the right to health, the environment and so forth uh, that has been uh, discussed at the General Assembly. And, uh, and thirdly, uh, the, the fact that uh, the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea was about to espouse how 70% of the planet should have um, shared responsibilities, the common heritage of humankind, these principles can and will be expanded further uh, between the uh, decisions and then sort of the discussion at the International Court of Justice. And one other fascinating uh, example that I'm kind of re-emphasizing here is how the Commission of Small Island States 
uh, really got together and moved the tribunal of the law of the sea. Now, the Commission of Small Island States are also appearing before the International Court of Justice. And this is a fascinating movement to see how a group of lawyers together with civil society, environmental groups, young people can mobilize the whole membership of the United Nations to agree on these things. Or to say some don't want to be the one saying no to it. I think that's another way of looking at it. It's, it's, it's fascinating amount of pressure that is being created for doing good. And I know within the principles of international law, we talk about Pakta Sun Sarvanda, about good faith, uh, those principles. But here is young people taking and epitomizing these values. And I think that's the fascinating aspect when young people who are now moved into the world youth climate justice that all of us are working in Alan specifically is also working with, is going to go before the International Court of Justice through the member states and other international organizations. And that space is, I think, something very important to look at. And, and that's where uh, the reverse complementarity and other principles will be uh, uh, kind of developed further uh, where I would, in my personal bias, look at the trajectory of international law and its impact and influence in this century is going to be quite paramount. So yes, I repeat, the ICJ advisory opinion on climate change is a quite a rare opportunity and possibly the most important case to be, go before the International Court of Justice this century. Um, and the um, the instance that you, you reference the most of young people particularly mobilizing from small Pacific island nations to bring a case before the ICJ, I think runs, uh, it, it's a powerful rejoinder to the common notion of politicization or selectivity in international law. We can get back to the ICC in a moment. There are some questions about that. But this is a very powerful instance of how the International Court of Justice can be used as a tool, not just by powerful states, but by those that are suffering the most. Um, and um, Neshan, thank you so much for mentioning the need for universal jurisdiction over compulsory disputes before the International Court of Justice, which only 74 of 193 United Nations states currently accept. Um, until this is whole, we will not have an end to impunity and a lack uh, and, and accountability will be lacking. We have several questions about the ICC. So I'm going to pivot back to our two previous speakers. Um, and James, if you could uh, do a, a spotlight um, or, or remove the spotlight on Neshan. He, thank you so much for your service at this moment. Uh, so there have been a number of questions about the, um, um, the I guess, availability of justice under the resource constraints of the court, um, and also um, whether or not there would be a politicization of uh, the crime of ecocide um, given the ICC's track record. So um, we've we've been asked about obstacles to ecocide as a fifth crime. And that I think um, to try to bundle that all up is what I would like to address to Kate um, and to Honorable Graham. And I also have a few thoughts on that, but um, to our esteemed speakers, would either of you like to take that question or bundled questions? I um, I'm happy to kick off. Um, I I had seen the question about the um, about the political se selectivity as it's in so the accusations that the ICC focuses on weaker states from the global south, which obviously has been the case, although perhaps it's rescued itself a little bit recently, or perhaps not. Um, yeah, I mean that's um, that's a very important question to think about. Um, much of, I think the reactions have tended to be in the other direction, actually, considering that a crime of ecocide might open the path for um, corporate actors in particular in the global north to be held accountable for environmental destruction that they're creating in the global south. So I think the crime of ecocide opens that possibility, whether 
the prosecutor, you know, what the prosecutor's strategy is going to be, of course, um, none of us can say. But I would say that ecocide is not per se a crime that is structured in a way to limit the accountability of the global north and perhaps even the other way around. Um, but I'd be very interested to hear what um, my co-panelist has to say about that from his um, diplomatic experience. Yes, thank you. Um, well, just I think on the issue that probably is most relevant to my own experience is the politicization issue. And uh, <laughs> I can remember the level of politicization when, when New Zealand went through its nuclear um, free policy in the 70s and 80s. Um, And I think probably to this day, New Zealand is the only country to have been um, cheerfully and diplomatically cast out of a nuclear alliance. Um, it was politicized. The issue of, of nuclear weapons was obviously highly politicized from, from the beginning. But it, it's one thing to have it in a global politicized sense. It's another thing to have it in your own harbor when boats, protest boats are going out and so on. So I, I think, um, we, and, and the, the other associated thought on this is that um, the, the issue, in, in not in New Zealand, but other countries, going back to, well, from the 40s on, uh, 1940s on, the issue of the concept and, and law of genocide uh, are highly politicized. I don't think ecocide could become more politicized than genocide has been and can continue to be. So I think we have to conclude from all, of, well, and war crimes. So I think we have to conclude from all of this that um, these issues, are, and that's why I pay such tribute to, to you and your colleagues, that they are the most sensitive and, and complex and critically important issues that humanity addresses. So your starting point is, is uh, our, all our starting point is from a background of its politicization of any act and the concept of it and the legal machinations that then ensue from it. Um, I had, it's interesting, I have to confess that I, I have been carrying for some, for a while and I'm, I'm prepared to drop it. Uh, a, a negative instinct about the word ecocide, thinking it would, whether given that we've got words in the World uh, Charter for Nature and other documentation, uh, and, and, and they're there in your definition, um, actually, and serious environmental harm, et cetera, et cetera. And there are actually uh, declarations headed that with, with that heading. And they are less inflammatory. Uh, just a phrase, three words, and a phrase is less inflammatory than that. But if we if we deal with genocide, um, then I have to ask myself why would we not deal with ecocide? And the task of the lawyers, the task of the political leaders, the diplomats, and the international lawyers, is to work on the basis of the politicization that is flying around us all and get to a stage where the lawyers, the drafts, the, the, the legal drafts people, and, and then, then the diplomats and the political leaders making the decisions are able to make informed and nuanced judgments that are reliable for decades and centuries based on highly politicized concepts and, and emotional feelings. Yeah, I can just quickly jump. There's, I can see a couple of other questions in the chat, but I'd love to just briefly also come back on ecocide. I also was very resistant to the term, actually, and I'm not sure why. It was something about, you know, uh, well, I, I just thought it maybe sounded a bit gimmicky or, um, but I've been convinced by the public reaction and, and the way the word just speaks what it means and everybody understands it. And, you know, and of course it does have a history which you highlighted in your presentation and it is used by 
you know, indigenous communities and, and by climate activists and environmentalists across the world. So I've, I've been converted, but I, I recognize your, your hesitation. Um, I can, oh, hang on, I'm seeing, oh, okay. I can see some things in the chat, but there's something in the Q and A, which I haven't looked at at all. So, oh. so Kate, I'll, I'll direct you <laughs> yeah. to, to one query in particular, yeah. which Please is um, that uh, particularly in the field of war and international humanitarian law, um, environmental crimes uh, are committed by corporate actors with increasing frequency, perhaps. Um, and where is the, the liability? Where's the accountability for, for corporate actors? Um, whereas the Rome statute um, distinguishes natural humans, natural persons rather, um, as its field of jurisdiction. And of course the ICJ has jurisdiction over states. Um, so where is corporate accountability herein? Yeah, um, great point. So the ICC, International Criminal Court, as you pointed out, Rebecca has jurisdiction only over individuals. Um, and that has been presented as a um, shortcoming um, in terms of ecocide being framed within the ICC statute um, with regard to corporate activities. Um, I'm not sure it is, actually, because as uh, Dr. Graham talked about in his presentation, I think individual criminal responsibility, so the threat of an individual facing, you know, going to prison, being convicted of an international crime, I think um, has a powerful deterrent effect. And I think it has a more powerful deterrent effect with regard to corporate behaviour than regard to the political actors, which are more typically the subject of investigations and prosecutions of the International Criminal Court currently. You know, I don't know the extent to which the leader of an armed group or other political faction, faction or of a country is deterred from their actions by the threat of prosecution by the International Criminal Court. I would love to think that they were, but I'm not sure. I think there might be other considerations which are more important. I do think that individual directors or CEOs or senior executives of corporations are far more likely to change their behavior based on a risk assessment, which includes being indicted and prosecuted for an international crime. I mean, corporations work on um, you know, reputation and share price. And I think both of those are quite likely to tank if the corporation is even connected with the word ecocide, let alone formal investigation be open. So I imagine that in that corporate decision making environment, uh, when the in-house counsel raises this could potentially qualify as an international crime of ecocide, I would think that a corporation would be a more kind of rational actor in that way and more likely to change course. So um, that's how I would uh, answer that question. May I make one more comment? Um, well, just very briefly, uh, back to the point I was making, and I, I didn't go into detail at the time, about the re relying on the 1982 World Charter for Nature, it, which has principles, functions, and Im implementation. And paragraph um, 21 of the Charter uh, states, and to the extent that they are able, individuals, groups, and corporations, shall, and then it goes on as to what they shall not do in terms of environmental damage. So the concept of corporations having legal liability and um, in, in international law, well, certainly at the diplomatic level of a declaration, uh, a UN General Assembly resolution is there. And, and I, I, th I think it's worth uh, resting it on that. Uh, thank you sincerely, Honorable Graham. And we have one hand up um, in the chat. At this point, we will elevate uh, folks who wish to come on camera and wish to be heard uh, to ask their questions. We have tried our best to address some of those in the chat about issue, issues like resources at the ICC, uh, jurisdiction thereof. Um, but please, we would like this to be an open discussion in our last few minutes. So I will look to see if there are any hands raised. Um, John German, are you interested in taking the floor? <laughs> 
Rebecca, I can see a question in the in the chat, which I haven't addressed, yes. um, which maybe I could just while we're waiting for people to put their hands up, which was from Matthew Ryan Sykes. Uh, well, actually, also one from Moses Muita. Maybe I could start with that one, um, which I think, in, unless Moses wants to restate his question, I think is about um, you know, whether ecocide could be used against local communities whose way of life is destroying the environment to a certain extent. Uh, you know, it's something which we would not want to happen, activities that could be considered a crime but might be necessary. Um, and that whether the um, crime could be localised to deal with that so that that balancing could be done at local level. I mean, I think um, as far as an international crime is concerned, you know, we tried to set the threshold very high. I mean, we're talking about something which is of concern to the international community. So an international crime of ecocide, you know, we're talking about something which is on a parallel with the crimes of genocide or crimes against humanity. So I think it's unlikely um, that something that's at a very contained local level would rise to that level. I do think that when ecocide is um, domesticated, as it as we're seeing happening, then that will be a question to be considered. I mean, generally, the way environmental law works, of course, is that it is a balancing of what people need to survive with sustaining the environment. So sustainable development being that core principle, which actually we also try to capture in our definition. Um, but you know, if things are working well, then states are nationally balancing those interests appropriately. Uh, what Ecoside is looking at is for when that's completely out of whack and there's no way we can say that nature has been used in a way which is not even sustainable. You know, we're saying it's gone way beyond that and it's been reckless. It's been recklessly destroyed for no good reason. So I don't know if that answers that question. Um, there was briefly one about sanctions against corporate entities. Um, so that we're talking about the International Criminal Court. So it would just be the individuals who would be sanctioned and potentially imprisoned. Um, so there isn't currently scope for more creative um, penalties at the International Criminal Court. Um, however, there is provision for reparations, which is interesting. So um, at the International Criminal Court, there is provision for victims of the crime to claim reparations. And I think there's some really interesting possibilities there um, when a corporate actor, you know, an individual is prosecuted. I would also add that that would be one reason why actually having the corporate entity, the legal person able to be prosecuted at the court, which is an amendment that would have to happen and many have argued for, would be quite useful because the corporate entity would have the resources to pay reparations to the victims of the crime. And this is one of the reasons why there is a proposition for an international environmental court with subject matter jurisdiction over environmental crimes that are both criminal and civil, that govern individuals, that govern corporate entities, and potentially even state actors. Um, and so we, have, I think, can put in the chat. And for those of you who have asked, we will download all of the chat links and, and make them available to everybody who has attended uh, and wish to attend the session. Um, um, but that is a proposal on the table. Similarly, with an international anti-corruption court, uh, there are conversations about what environmental crimes would entail and how they would be uh, visited upon corporate actors as opposed to individuals at or as opposed to states. Um, in the floor, um, I can see some questions about what role can civil society play in advocating for the inclusion of ecocide in the ICC's jurisdiction? And how can we effectively mobilize public support and pressure governments to take action? Um, I'll couple this with one other question about um, uh, the ICC seem to have lopsided prosecution toward weak states and still presents the best option for proposed ecocide. So maybe how can civil society um, be um, uh, enlisted to confront what I would say is kind of a false perception of ICC's asymmetry and then enlist it um, more properly toward the crime of ecocide. Um, 
And we'll get to a question for Neshan on um, ICJ shortly. But I think this is still for Honorable Graham and, and Kate. I, I can just simply say, um, well, I'll answer both both of those questions. Civil civil society, I, I, I think it's self-evident uh, what civil society is doing these days. I, I can remember when I was living in New York in the 90s and going across the road to the General Assembly and other UN meetings, and it was rare for civil society to be given any kind of representative uh, existence uh, at that stage. Uh, but in the in the course of the 90s, it really started to move on, and that's point one. Point two in the 20 in the in the 21st century, it's the youth, and especially with regard to ecocide and environmental damage, it's the youth for obvious reasons that are, are taking up the the uh, the cudgel, and uh, they're doing it very effectively uh, too. Um, so I think it's self evident that the civil society has a major role to play in pushing the political leaders. I loved being pushed by young people uh, when I was a member of parliament. It, 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 uh, it, was, it was good interacting with them and it was good to actually um, be able to work on the basis of their, their momentum. Um, but it's, so I think it's, 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 it's there uh, for political leaders and, um, and the diplomats to be uh, courteously responding to civil society, actually. And I, I think that's happening to a point too. On the issue of ICC and the weak states, uh, yes, but what's new? Um, the international community, the ICC is no, and its work, which I hugely respect actually, is, is no more or no less than the way the Security Council operates. Um, the, uh, the, by definition, the, the major powers are there. But you look at the Rome Statute, and it doesn't have the, the P3, uh, USA, China, Russia. It does not have India. It does not have Iran, um, Israel, uh, so many others. However, it has 124 states that operate pretty well. And the professionals inside running the, the court um, are highly professional. So um, I was at an ICC meeting in, in uh, Senegal um, some years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, which was looking at exactly that issue. And I was impressed by the democratic dialogue that the African states, members of the ICC, were maintaining on the debating floor and emerged with an extremely informed conclusion. So I'm one of those who still has confidence in and hopes for the, the future of the ICC. Uh, thank you so much. We're at time. Um, I will put one question to all. Well, actually, I think we have one uh, individual from the floor who would like to ask a question. So Anna muller Loswick. Um, if you could be spotlighted by our, elevated to a panelist and spotlighted by our lovely esteemed technical team. I will do, just to bear in mind, Anna, you will be logged out and logged back in again, possibly when you're elevated. So it might take one second. And then we'll have a final round. We're a little bit over time. We'll just go five minutes longer after Anna has her intervention. I would just say that I put the Stop Ecoside website in the chat, um, which people might be interested to explore in terms of joining with others around the world uh, if, you, if you're looking for a framework. Absolutely. And we have that along with many other links, including your report uh, that we'll share with everybody after uh, this, this panel. Anna, please, over to you. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, I had a question about, sorry, I can introduce myself. I'm Anna Malalaswik and I work for a private, private foundation in Stockholm called the Global Challenge Foundation. And we're currently looking into how we can support efforts uh, related to ecocide. So this was really, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, when it, look, when it comes to the current crimes uh, under the Rome Statute, they seem to me at least being very linked to conflict and war. But then now we have a fifth, potential fifth crime that is 
you know, much broader in the sense that it can be both committed directly by uh, companies, but also as a consequence of war. And I know Ukraine has pushed this very hard in terms of accountability for Russia's crimes in Ukraine. Would this have implications for the work of the ICC um, in terms of how to deal with these different kinds of, of crimes? Also looking at the definition and, um, you know, whether is, there is intent or not, um, or if it's rather a consequence, for instance, of uh, an ongoing war and uh, like Russia's uh, crimes in Ukraine. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. And I'm super interested to hear about your, your work. Um, so the crimes against humanity and genocide um, do not have to be committed within the context of armed conflict. There's no requirement in that in those crimes for that to happen. Of course, quite often they do accompany armed conflict. Mm -hmm. So your observation is correct. But legally, um, a crime against humanity can be can be committed in peacetime. And so, for example, the I don't know if you were on the webinar earlier, but I, with the example I gave of the Cambodian forcible displacement of people for commercial reasons that uh, I mean that wasn't taken up by the prosecutor but legally that could qualify as a crime against humanity so a widespread and systematic or widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population essentially is your crime against humanity um so ecocide is not defined as as having an element of armed conflict of course so like crimes against humanity it could be prosecuted in times of war or peace However, I do think you raise a good point about whether, you know, the extent to which it requ might require different expertise or different techniques to the current crimes. And I think that is a point. Um, I'm hopeful that the prosecutor's environmental crimes policy that he's currently working on signals a willingness to develop some kind of expertise in environmental harm. Um, but certainly, I mean, I'm actually involved with those accountability efforts in Ukraine for the environmental war crimes. And it's clear that there's a huge amount of you know, scientific expertise. You need baseline information so that you can show that there's been a degradation. You know, you need a significant capacity. And um, yeah, that would that will have to be developed for effective prosecution. So I think I think it's a very relevant point as well as actually the expertise of the judges. You know, they may require I mean, there will need to be scientific evidence clearly brought and the judges will have to have the capacity to to understand that evidence so it thank is you. somewhat of a shift in the direction thank you i don't, I don't know i'll just very very quickly um on the point about that icc being in on, on conflict and war, it's, it's worth quick, a quick historical note that actually the, the original intent to set up that kind of court, court occurred in the 1940s following Nuremberg. And uh, it, they, they were seriously looking at it and debating it in 1951, and it was blocked uh, for a variety of reasons. And it was just put into the, into the freezing, freezer. And it was not until the early 90s. Um, I remember going into Trinidad and Tobago, who they were the country that basically kick-started it again in uh, 1992 and meeting A.N.R. Robinson, who was the extraordinary gentleman, former prime minister, who, who kick-started the thing. And believe it or not, uh, he persuaded the Caribbean colleague states to initiate, reinitiate it and put it back on the General Assembly. It was based on drug trafficking and, and other things as well, but it really then kicked in and Italy took it over, and Canada and, and EU. And it was negotiated in an extraordinarily narrow, um, small time period. It was brilliant work. Thank you. I, yeah, I always have um, an issue when I um, asked about how long did the um, ICC take to come into being? Because do you start from the negotiations in New York and Rome, or do you start from the moment that you described, uh, 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 Honorable Graham, um, where it was contemplated at the same time as the ICJ? Um, and so I, I usually use both narratives. Um, I we're over time. Uh, I would like to give one more round for our uh, panelists of optimism uh, in international courts and tribunals and where you might see the uh, 
the next wind, the next turn of the corner. Um, this is, of course, uh, a um, event that is put together based on impact coalitions that were founded in the anticipation of the Summit of the Future this fall, or actually in just a few short weeks in September. What will that hold for international justice? Uh, can we hold out optimism? Um, so Nashan, if you wouldn't mind, my friend, uh, can I go over to you for a last word and then circle around a little bit more? Sure, Rebecca. Thank you so much. And uh, it's been incredibly learning and listening to both Professor McIntosh and uh, Honorable Graham, as well as uh, the wonderful questions that were posed. Yeah, to being optimistic, um, uh, we have to be. Uh, I think uh, it's, again, I believe a time of ideas uh, when the 125th anniversary of uh, the Hague process, setting up these institutions uh, are being celebrated. And I think we are in a time of uh, transition for both humanity and the planet. And I think that's where international law and legal principles that our ancestors have worked out is going to be critical how we determine the current and, and the future. So we are in that transitional period, and I'm really optimistic looking at the energy that young people are bringing across the board, how these institutions will speak with each other and aid each other in bringing about a stronger international rule of law. Uh, and and for now and for the future. So hope to be in this dialogue as we move. And thank you so much again for the invitation. Um, Honorable Graham, going in reverse speaking order, I suppose. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for the uh, discussion and the opportunity. It's it's been very interesting. I am um, I. Uh, I think we're in for a tough few decades, and I think it's more a matter of chance rather than our um, managerial capacities as to where it'll emerge. Uh, but the most optimistic thing that I can offer is that when I was near the end of my career, when I was teaching this stuff, um, uh, I used to make sure that I'd challenge in terms of a formal question or essay uh, in an exam or an essay, the students to sit down and rewrite the UN Charter in a way that would solve all the problems of the world. And doing it myself and then doing it with them was a remarkably difficult thing to do. But it, it begged all the fundamental questions of how we construct our political and societal uh, structures in the 20th and 21st century. And um, But I think it's a very um, useful thing to do because it... It, it drives your uh, either pessimism or concern uh, or compassion into a constructive way of how do you improve the future? So let's try for that. And so this is more than a thought exercise for some of us in civil society who um, are involved with some of the future process because there is now agitation around the fact that the UN Charter was meant to be a living document and Article 108 and 109 are there for a reason. Um, and so there are coalitions that are coming together to work with states to envision what it might look like to break open the box and to, to look at the charter and uh, un unpack its elements. Kate, over to you. Well, I'm going to go back to optimism because I think, first of all, international law is really having a moment. I mean, I don't know how many people on this call were familiar with the international or whose family members, you know, were familiar with the International Court of Justice just two years ago. And now I feel like everybody's heard of the International Court of Justice, you know, whether that's around South Africa versus Israel or, you know, the other Russia, Ukraine or the other, you know, top of the headlines issues that are being adjudicated before the courts. And I think I would just like to, you know, repeat and uplift what Neshan said about the advisory opinion on state responsibilities in the face of climate change at the International Court of Justice, which is going to be heard this December, week of 2nd December, the hearings start. This really is uh, the most important case this century, Neshan, I fully agree with you. And that is going to be quite a week because it will also be the week that the Assembly of States parties of the International Criminal Court opens. And I very much hope that there will have been a proposal to amend the statute to include ecocide made um, at the appropriate moment before then. So it may be that this December in The Hague, we will have both of these really 
important decisions. And I mean, really, the ICJ decision is far and away the most important. It's so thrilling and that it really started with the Pacific youth that the tiny nation of Vanuatu, I mean, Neshan went through all of this, but just to repeat Neshan, that the tiny nation of Vanuatu was able to get the whole General Assembly to refer this question to the court, that I think 65 states have submitted written comments. Uh, it's going to be absolutely huge. And I think we may have the right court. I mean, we may have a court that is going to give us, you know, a really useful advisory opinion. So um, I think from the perspective of this discussion series around the role of international courts and institutions, you know, international courts and institutions are really being looked to in a way that they haven't been for many decades. And I would say that they are rising to the occasion. So I'm very optimistic and excited about this particular path forward. Thank you so much to our esteemed speakers. Um, in the chat, you have numerous links to um, resources that we will share with all of you. Um, we would like to commend your attention to the Legal Alternatives to War Campaign and Just Institutions and the International Court of Justice Impact Coalition and Earth Go Governance Coalition that convened this series. Um, again, the links are in the chat. Um, it just remains for me to be in awe of our esteemed speakers, Kate McIntosh, Honorable Kennedy Graham, and of course, my friend Neshan Gunasakara. Thank you all very much. We will stop recording now and end the webinar. And I think you have our information for further follow up. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Many thanks.